All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And I am here for another Fiveable broadcast. Hello. Uh, let's see. Ale Alexia. I'll, I'll, uh, Alexia. Alexia, I think. OK, so I'm trying to trying to sound that out there. Hopefully I've got it right or close to right. OK, and we've already got a few questions. OK, now remember, our emphasis area for tonight is uh, is American imperialism, which I'm going to be focusing on. But then we can also take some other questions as well if we've got them. OK, so let's go ahead. If you've got questions, especially questions related to the topic. But then again, remember, if you've got something that might uh, be from some other time, that's OK, too. And especially if it gets some upvotes. Uh, now, remember, uh, you can upvote questions if you think, hey, I have that question, too. Now, last week we were talking about remember it's not really polite to go into the chat and ask people to upvote your question okay instead everybody make sure you're checking the questions now and then and upvote the ones that you think uh, you would like to see answered now remember priority uh, tonight will go to questions about imperialism but we can also do some other things uh, some other things as well all right so we've got a few questions coming in and then i'll be giving a little talk on imperialism as well okay so i've got some stuff coming up right now all right ladies and gentlemen let's see what we've got here in the questions and remember that we're going to be here free all the way through the end of april once a week now if you want access to replays because i know you can't always make these live and if you want access to the cram sessions that fiveable is going to be doing close to the exam be sure to go to fiveable.me and check out fiveable plus okay there's a great deal going on that right now okay um hmm YouTube videos on visual documents. Okay. So Zoe, all right. So you're asking about uh, websites with political cartoons related to APUSH. Now, I would say, first of all, Thomas Nast is someone that, you know, you could definitely look into if you're wanting uh, cartoons about the guilt from the Gilded Age from a Republican perspective. Now, also, there's Puck Magazine, which is, uh, you know, which was a publication that was more from a Democrat democratic perspective at that time. Now, as far as, uh, you know, websites and such, I, I think that it's, it's important just to understand that visual documents are really not, uh, you know, not any more, uh, you know, any more, they're not any different than any other, any other document. Now, Layla, if you're, since you're asking, let me just uh, be clear, we're, these broadcasts last one hour, okay? So we do this for one hour. And remember, Fiveable Plus members have access to replays, whereas uh, people who are joining us free get to look at it live now as far as that goes remember it's just like anything else it's got point of view and it's trying to say something okay there's something that's trying to be said one of the things that i think is probably the most accessible when we're dealing with visual sources um is paul revere's uh, engraving of the boston massacre okay because now if we know the context of the boston massacre uh then we know that there is a lot about this uh you know about this engraving that's misleading let me go ahead and share my screen with you here um, but this is something anytime i'm talking about visual sources i think that this source is very uh very important okay so as far as that goes let me go in here i'm trying to share my screen and let's see if it lets me wait for it okay not sure what happened there okay so let's see what happens now okay well that could uh might not be the best thing that ever happened and I'm actually sharing the screen. Okay, so the screen is sharing now. All right, so when we look here, uh, you know, we know, if we know the context, the story behind this is actually that there were colonists in Boston, dock workers and such, uh, probably had had a little bit to drink, that were harassing these Brit this British soldier. And this British soldier, you know, called in some backup. And of course, some more colonists showed up. And it was nighttime and they're yelling and screaming and throwing snowballs and, uh, and ice and rocks rocks. And the thing is that five people are killed and then some other people are injured when the British troops open fire. Now, what Paul Revere has done here 
is that you see that how the British soldiers are all lined up. Their commander is holding up his sword as if he's issuing an order to fire. Then we look at all of these, you know, very poor, defenseless people. We've got a dog there. Um, then all of a sudden, there's just a woman in the middle there doing some mourning, it looks like, already. Um, from what I can see, they're clothed in black. And so as far as that goes, the whole characterization of this is the Boston Massacre. Uh, this is a visual source that's meant to communicate this. Now, what we have to remember as well is that this has a POV. Paul Revere was a member of the Sons of Liberty, which was an organization at that time that really wasn't representative of the mainstream of public opinion. These were people who wanted to undermine British authority uh, at any cost, even if they've got to, you know, misrepresent what happened here. OK, so as far as that, as far as that goes, that's what we're, uh, you know, that's that's what we're we're looking at here. And so that is a great example of a visual source. OK, when we're thinking about that kind of stuff. But really, it's just uh, don't overcomplicate it is what I what I would say that as long as you understand that just like a written source, um, it is, you know, it's got a point of view. There's a context, there's an intended audience, and it has a purpose to it. Um, just interpret it the same way that you would a written source. That's my, my best advice to you on that. All right. Now, here's the thing. Uh, Haley, you are asking me, was American imperialism more political than economic or was it equal? OK, now let me give you some advice here. Now, I just put out a video on my YouTube channel last week and I plan on uh, doing some more stuff with this, uh, especially in terms of like Civil War historiography, is that there are facts, opinions and judgments. OK, like when we're talking about opinions, you know, I like strawberry ice cream. Jeb Stewart had a cool beard, you know, or something like that. Uh, that, you know, when we're thinking about those things, then those are opinions. Those really don't matter. OK, that's just something somebody doesn't have to justify, doesn't have to put anything up for it or anything like that. Now, facts. The Battle of Gettysburg occurred in July of 1863 fact. OK, uh, that was a union victory fact. Now, then we get into historical judgments. You know, was the Battle of Gettysburg the, uh, you know, the biggest turning point of the American Civil War? We can get into judgments here. Now, was American imperialism more political than economic or was it equal? Now, let's get stay away from was it equal, OK, because let me explain to you how these things work. When you have to do a DBQ or an LEQ prompt that you're going to take a side, OK, that they're they're wanting you to take a side and avoid that no man's land, that kind of lukewarm sort of thing. Okay. So imagine zero and a hundred, those are purely like imaginary, like in no case, are you going to find like, it was all political. It was all economic. Okay. Now, then when you go into the no man's land, it's like half political, half economic, stay away from that because you can't argue something. So what you need to come up with, and this is a historical judgment. This is where you start doing the work of a historian is that you Draw a little line, draw a little vertical line down your paper and put on one side political, on the other side economic and come up with your own explanation. That's what you need to be looking into because that's what you're going to be doing on a DBQ or an LAQ because you're going to be invited to say like, OK, well, this is the argument uh, that I'm making here. And so if we were to ask one historian, they'd say, oh, totally political and another one, oh, totally economic. Um, and so this is something that we have to realize that this isn't a fact. It is a historical judgment. Now, the other thing here is when you say political, I think that, you know, that's a little bit, uh, I would think in terms of, you know, strategic, military, that sort of thing, because a lot of this is about naval bases, uh, you know, about about spreading out and having naval bases all over the world. OK, so so there's the thing, uh, Haley, make sure that you are coming up with an argument for this and deciding, OK, it's either more this or more that. And here is my evidence to back it up. And let's not let's not forget to acknowledge that there is a counter argument. There is another side. Now, of course, you can uh, you, you can explain why you don't find that as credible, but we're still having a discussion about it. Got it. So with that, I would that would be my answer to that question. 
Okay, um, what are the causes of imperialism? Okay, um, get to that in just a second. Okay, and I see I've got some Spanish American War questions, so we'll definitely uh, we'll definitely get to that. Uh, now, as far as that, uh, can I explain vertical and horizontal integration? Uh, Stefania, I've actually got a video on this. If you search for vertical and horizontal integration, it's like when my channel was still like pretty new, like it was around 2013, I believe. Now, think about the human body. Okay, so when we think about it, eyes, ears head, shoulders, knees, and toes, that basically I've got two hands, vertical, right? I've got two eyes, two ears, okay? All of this stuff is vertical. Now, so vertical integration is, this is like Rockefeller buying up all of the oil refineries. This is when you are buying up businesses that are just like yours, okay? And so then horizontal integration, eyes, mouth, you know, head, shoulders, knees, and toes. So I've got two shoulders here, vertical, but then if I'm integrating horizontally, now this was Andrew Carnegie, the, the primary model of Andrew Carnegie. Now, Andrew Carnegie wanted to decide, he wanted to control his supply chain because when you don't own your supply chain, then people are going to mark it up. You've got to pay the owner of this and then you've got to do it on their time. And so Andrew Carnegie decided that I want to own like everything from the mines to the mill and everything else. Okay. So I want to own the entire process of steel making. And so that is the vertical integration is what you see more from Carnegie. And so vertical integration for Rockefeller, see Rockefeller had something he wanted to do. He refined oil. All right. So it's like oil refineries. And that is standard oil. OK, is, is the oil refineries. Rockefeller didn't uh, didn't do like the, you know, going and drilling for oil. That's what he was doing initially. And then he realized, hey, if I could learn how to refine oil really well, that would uh, that would be a lot less risky and I'd have a good steady income. So that's vertical and horizontal integration. Just remember horizontal, horizontal, horizontal. OK, vertical, different stuff supply chain. All right. Think about like digestion or something like that, you know? Okay. And as far as, uh, as far as that goes, let's go ahead and, um, and think about this in terms, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and share a bit of my, uh, imperialism lecture and kind of go into the background and, and explain why imperialism was such a big deal. Okay. So why is it that imperialism was such a big deal. Now, I don't know why this is, okay, here we go, here we go. It's just taking a little while for whatever reason. I probably need to restart my computer. All right, so as far as this goes, okay, when we look at American imperialism, like today, now this is a little old, I probably need to update this, but this is U.S. troop deployments as of 2007, okay? The United States has troops in so many places across the world, okay? And so our troops are all over the place. And then you look at, uh, you know, what they call historically isolationism. Now, we have to remember that isolationism is, it tends to be a pejorative term. Like people won't necessarily say, I am an isolationist. Ah, stay hydrated, kids. So you wouldn't say I am an isolationist. You would say you are an isolationist because when we think isolated. That's not really something that we think, oh, yeah, I like being isolated. And so isolationism, you know, this is the word that's given by people who want to be more interventionist to the traditional Washingtonian, Jeffersonian foreign policy. Now, remember to give both of them credit, because although Jefferson wasn't a fan of Washington's neutrality proclamation, he was secretary of state as president. Jefferson did uh, adhere to Washington's foreign policy. And so in Washington's farewell address, he said, it is our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world. And then Jefferson, peace, 
commerce, and honest friendship with all nations, entangling alliances with none. Now, this is uh, kind of curious here because a lot of people, when they hear no entangling alliances, they think that goes back to George Washington. But the term entangling alliances is actually a Jeffersonian term. And so Jefferson tried very hard as president to continue to implement this policy of neutrality. And this was largely United States policy for a long time. Now, remember that the United States was actually, you know, expanding uh, across uh, across the continent at that time. So, you know, there wasn't when European powers started getting into the whole imperialism thing um, in the 1870s, the United States was still focused on industrializing, uh, building a transcontinental railroad and the like. So as far as that goes, that, you know, isolationism versus interventionism or what we would call neutrality, Washington and Jefferson would have called it the neutrality policy. And in the 19th century, the United States was largely uh, was largely neutral. OK, and basically avoid conflicts with other nations whenever possible. And then. In the 20th century, you see a much more, you know, much more of a willingness to intervene. Now, what we have to remember is <clears throat> this 19th century foreign policy is not necessarily gone and it never has been gone. Uh, President Trump was talking last night in the State of the Union about how great nations do not involve themselves in endless wars. Um, that what, what President Trump was talking about yesterday was, you know, really harking back, you know, harkening back to the Washingtonian Jeffersonian foreign policy. So he's looking to remove some troops out of Syria and Afghanistan. And so the thing is, although the United States in the 20th century showed much more willingness to intervene and even in the late 20th century to take a leadership role in the world, uh, there still is that, uh, you know, that Washingtonian Jeffersonian undercurrent in our foreign policy. This has not gone away. Now, the Monroe Doctrine. We have to go back and remember the Monroe Doctrine. Now, George H.W. Bush, <clears throat> rest in peace, he just died, right? But he said he was most famous for, uh, you know, when he ran for president in 1988, he said, read my lips, no new taxes. And <clears throat> then he proceeded to sign a tax increase uh, later on when he was president. <clears throat> Sorry about this, ladies and gentlemen. Still kind of the uh, the winter season here. Now, the Monroe Doctrine. James Monroe's basically telling Europe, read my lips, no new colonies. Okay, so really this is, even though the United States is, you know, neutral when it came to Europe, um, there still is the Monroe Doctrine kind of forms the, the backbone of U.S. foreign policy um, in the sense that, uh, you know, he's saying that we don't want European dominance, European military presence, uh, you know, or anything in, in the, you know, in the Americas. And of course, the United States didn't really have the military capacity to enforce this at the time, but the British liked the idea as well and kind of helped out. And so this was the United States at the time of the Monroe Doctrine, that we were really still concerned with moving west more than anything else, okay? Manifest destiny happens. And so now, you know, the British have put together a very impressive empire. And so the United States gets involved. Now, remember, even today, we are a member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which is a mutual defense pact established in 1949. And there are uh, you know, lots of nations that we are obligated. Uh, we are we're obligated to defend if they're attacked. OK, so all of these countries are part of NATO that we see here in blue. And so we go into this whole idea of being a world power. Now, 1898, I would put this on your list of need to know years, you know, right next to 1607, 1492, 1754. Uh, I would make sure that this is on your list of, uh, you know, on your list here. OK, so I would make sure that that, uh, you know, that 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 that's on your list. All right. So as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, um, sea power as well. OK, so when we think about 
uh, that this is, you know, like what are the motives for imperialism? One of these was to uh, was to spread the United States naval power. Now, this goes back to Alfred Thayer Mahan, who in 1890 published The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. And so his thesis here is looking back at historical conflicts and like geopolitics and all of that, that great nations have great navies. Okay. That is what he ends up, uh, what the conclusion that he ends up reaching. And this is something that people took very seriously at the time. And the United States still takes seriously. Okay. Um, if we are to look at, uh, for example, one thing that I always enjoy looking up is aircraft carriers currently in service okay so a list of aircraft carriers in service there you go wikipedia you can learn anything there can't you and so as far as that goes the united states right now okay so the united states now there are only uh one two three four five six seven, about eight countries that are operating fixed wing aircraft carriers. Oh, it says it right here. I didn't have to count them. And then some of them operating helicopter carriers, which uh, comparatively are not uh, not nearly as cool, right? Um, but as far as that goes, if we look at uh, if we look at commissioned uh, commissioned carriers, the United States has 24 aircraft carriers currently in service, two under construction and two more ordered. Now, when we count the rest of them, okay, when we count the rest of them, it's 25. Now, we'll have 25 soon, but the United States has about as many aircraft carriers as the rest of the world combined. And so this is something that, you know, the United States still very much relies on a powerful Navy in order to project our, uh, you know, our world power. And of course, today there is a Mahan Hall at the U.S. Military Academy. All right. So that's one of the things. And of course, uh, you know, Hawaii, uh, being, uh, you know, being one of the first thing, you know, we actually annex Hawaii in 1898, which is the same year as the Spanish-American War. And when we look at the location of Hawaii, we can see that it's right here in the middle. OK, so there it is a a refueling station for air, you know, for any kind of ships that are going through, you know, United States naval vessels that are going through here. And so as far as that, let me go ahead and take a look at the questions and see what we've got, uh, what we've got there. Okay. So as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, Madeline, let me go ahead and just go into a uh, few things, a uh, few things here. Now, can you save the videos? Uh, Eric, what are you talking about? Save the videos. Uh, be be a little, uh, you know, a little more clear what you're asking here. If you're asking if you can replay these review sessions, if you are subscribed to Fiveable Plus, you can replay these sessions. OK, so for more information about Fiveable Plus, go to Fiveable.me. Uh, you probably went there sometime you know, during this. OK, so make sure that you that you do that if you want to look at the replays. All right. So first of all, as I just mentioned uh, that you've got naval naval vessels all right now the united states also was looking to expand its markets i mean we almost see another version of mercantilism because at this time the united states had very high tariffs which were interfering with trade like the united states was much more concerned about industrializing and building up internal industries and you know basically you know with going and making these uh you know these well, colonies essentially right these imperial possessions it made more of a market for american goods and a source of raw materials so it's almost like you know it's very very much i mean you could compare it to how the british uh, and other countries had colonies during the age of exploration so for one thing the naval power the next thing you've got of course the you know the economic motives uh, to try to you know have these uh, you know, places where Americans can do business, all right, and places that are friendly to American business interests, think places that will supply us with raw materials and also purchase our finished goods, our industrial goods. So those are 
a couple of them. Now, another one, when you go into um, scientific racism, which a lot of people conflate with social Darwinism, uh, you know, as far as these other people, you know, these these non-white uh, Pacific Islanders and Latin Americans, uh, that they don't really deserve to govern themselves. They're not really ready to govern themselves. And that's that's, of course, going into it as well. Now, there's also the idea of the civilizing mission, the so-called white man's burden. Uh, Rudyard Kipling had a poem uh, called white, The White Man's Burden. It was like, take up the white man's burden, that you're doing this to help, okay? A lot of people, you know, when, when you're doing something for your own benefit, uh, a lot of times it, it makes you feel better when you're like, well, you know what? I'm actually doing this to help people. I'm not doing this to uh, exploit other people. I'm doing this to help. See, we just made a school over there, that sort of thing, you see? And so those are a few of the causes of imperialism that I would get into. Now, remember, as far as which one's most important, that kind of goes into, uh, that kind of goes into, into you. Now, what are the reasons as to why the Spanish-American War was the turning point in American foreign policy? All right, so before 1898, the United States was not, I mean, we had purchased Alaska from the Russians. Of course, now we know there are all kinds of uh, natural resources over there. Ended up being a pretty good deal for us. But at the time, people were like, why? All right. And so the Spanish-American War was in 1898, now also the same year that we annexed Hawaii. And so why was this a turning point? OK, now, as a result of the Spanish-American War, the United States gained three imperial possessions. All right. So let's see, trying to share my screen again here and. OK, we are sharing. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So moving on, let's get on in here. And so as far as we're going, uh, as we're going there, let's see. So the Spanish-American War. All right, let's see. All right. So the Treaty of Paris, 1898. The United States gives $20 million to Spain in return for a free Cuba. Now we're gonna put this in air quotes, okay? Because this is really a Cuba that's dominated by the United States, but in, in name free, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines, okay? So the United States now has these three possessions, two of which we still, we still have. Puerto Rico and Guam are still part of the United States and uh, the Philippines, uh, you know, of course, is an independent country now. But at the same time, uh, you know, it wasn't, uh, you know, wasn't, you know, it wasn't always so. The United States had it for quite a while. All right. So as far as, uh, you know, as far as that goes, um, you know, that's something that you could, um, yeah, that, that's really a big turning point there because we're dealing with that. Now, also at the time, uh, Puerto Rico, uh, not, I mean, not Puerto Rico, but the Philippines, okay? The Philippines were fighting a war of independence, all right? So the United States, they get the Philippines. Now, the Philippines were fighting against, uh, you know, against the Spanish for independence. And so the United States inherits imperial, you know, this imperial possession. And we basically start uh, fighting against these people who are fighting for it now for independence against the United States. And it's uh, it's really as far as that goes. Now, uh, this is a Republican advertisement. Now, where did that uh, I'm trying to find the full advertisement. All right. So here is a, a polit. Now, here's a visual source for those of you who wanted to see that. Now, this is. Uh, you can see here, this is a Republican uh, thing here. Now, the Republicans won in 1896, uh, where there had been a Democratic president previously. Now, gone Democratic, gone Republican. A run on the bank, a bank run. Everybody run the bank to get their money out. And then a run to the bank. Now we're going to the bank. Now, this says Spanish rule in Cuba. You see them all in chains there. And then American rule in Cuba. OK, so American rule in Cuba. The American flag has not been planted on for in foreign soil to acquire more territory, but for humanity's sake. Now, it's kind of funny there because American rule in Cuba, it kind of gives the lie to what, uh, you know, what we were talking about, uh, what we were talking about earlier, that, you know, Cuba is independent. But clearly the McKinley campaign sees that the United States 
uh, the United States owns Cuba, so to speak. And I'll talk about the Teller and Platt amendments, amendments again in a second because people were asking. So the thing is, I mean, here's something that's going on here in the Philippines at the time. And there was a an order to kill everyone over 10. All right, because the Filipinos were using, you know, which is which is common in this type of warfare, uh, were using teenage boys uh, to, you know, to run some of these errands or to sneak in and shoot somebody and that sort of thing. And so as far, far as that goes, you see that these boys are being shot by an American firing squad. Now, I have not looked into this exact situation, so I'm not sure exactly, you know, that I can verify this or not. But certainly a lot of Americans are concerned. And the Anti-Imperialist League was organized largely because of what was going on in the Philippines, because a lot of people saw that as fundamentally un-American. Okay. But of course, there's definitely some propaganda here, you know, that there was what was going on uh, in Cuba, in Puerto Rico, the Philippines, Hawaii, um, the Isthmus of Panama, the Spanish had them under industrial slavery and all of this. And then now look at everybody with their money and everybody is so happy there. Okay. And so as far as that goes, the Anti-Imperialist League was organized, included Mark Twain, Andrew Carnegie, uh, William Graham Sumner, who you may not have heard of, but who was one of the leading intellectuals at the time. He was a professor at Yale. And William Graham Sumner gave a speech uh, titled The Conquest of the United States by Spain. And of course, he's using irony here in the uh, in the title. And, you know, what he's what he's saying, what he's asking here, if we Americans believe in self-government, why do we let it slip away from us? Why do we barter barter it away from military glory as Spain did? And so what's worrying William Graham Sumner and others is that the United States is taking on these imperial possessions. And are we going to become just like other nations? OK, which you think about uh, the idea now, of course, uh, you know, some people believe in this a lot more than others. But the idea of American exceptionalism, that America is, uh, you know, is really is really in Ways, a lot of ways different than other countries. So what happens if we become like everybody else? And if you take away the Constitution, what is American liberty and all the rest? Nothing but a lot of phrases, okay, that, you know, he's worried that we're losing the very essence of America. And Mark Twain suggested that so that we don't dishonor the American flag, um, that possibly we think about turning the white stripes black and having a skull and crossbones instead of the stars so that we can have another flag to plant on these imperial possessions uh, so that we don't have to dishonor our own flag with the kind of behavior that we're seeing in the Philippines. And so that I think is, you know, is a, in a large part why the Spanish American War in 1898 in particular uh, is is there. Okay. So as far as that, uh, as that goes now, Justine, as far as, is there a way uh, to know which general topics will be covered? Uh, yes. If you're following Fiveable, think Fiveable on Twitter and on Instagram, uh, they publish these things. They, you know, we've actually got the titles for the next several things. So my, my suggestion would be to, uh, to follow think Fiveable. Follow Think Fiveable on Twitter and Instagram. Okay, so yeah, so they're basically now. Remember, uh, you know, we don't have to. You know, we've got our emphasis area, but when there are questions that are getting up votes, uh, you know, we give uh, we give stuff to that as well. Okay, so as far as that uh, as far as that goes, uh, can I explain the Teller and Platt? Amendments. Yes, I can, Joseph. I would be more than happy to. OK, so the Teller and Platt Amendments. OK, now, first of all, the Teller Amendment is you know, this is before we get involved in the Spanish-American War when Cuba is seeking their independence. And so the Teller Amendment is saying that the United States has no interest in annexing Cuba. Now, the way that I remember the Teller Amendment is go to Cuba and tell her we don't want her. OK, go to Cuba and tell her we don't want her. And so then the Platt Amendment 
is after um, Cuba gets its independence. And the United States, uh, you know, is like, OK, well, we don't want you to be part of the United States, but you're not quite ready to be on your own. So we're going to give you these uh, these conditions here. The main thing about the Platt Amendment is it authorized the United States military to it to the United States to send the military to intervene in cases of civil unrest. All right. So if there's civil unrest, which I think was done three times in the early 20th century. If there's civil unrest, the United States will send its military in to keep order. Now, also, Cuba could not have excessive public debt, um, you know, which sounds kind of hypocritical when you think about the United States today, right? Excessive public debt or um, to make treaties without U.S. approval. Now, we also got a perpetual naval lease at Guantanamo Bay, and which we still have. The United States still has a naval base at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. And so as far as that goes, the Platt Amendment placed several restrictions on Cuba after attaining their independence. So they were still somewhat responsible to the United States. And what we want to realize from that is that created a legacy of resentment, okay, that there were people who resented this. And, you know, that's what led eventually one of the things that led to the Cuban Revolution in the 1950s. OK, so can I explain the Teller and Platt Amendments? Yes. Go to Cuba, tell her we don't want her. And then, of course, the Platt Amendment uh, is this set of restrictions after Cuba attained its independence. All right. The difference is, OK, so Haruko. I wouldn't get too much into this. Uh, you know, I think that it's more, you know, part of this is probably semantics. Now, colonialism is, you know, a lot of times you think about colonialism where you're sending settlers to the extent that we could distinguish colonialism, you're sending settlers and imperialism, you're more ruling the people who are already there. Um, so, you know, when we think about imperialism, you know, as far as, uh, you know, Puerto Rico, it's not like the United States has sent a lot of settlers to Puerto Rico. Uh, Puerto Rico is an imperial possession of the United States. Now, of course, Puerto Ricans are U.S. citizens with the full benefit of being U.S. citizens, but it's still an imperial possession of the United States. And you haven't seen like, you know, a an effort to bring like, you know, Americans from the continental United States to Puerto Rico. So that would be to the extent that there is a difference, but I don't know that that would necessarily be something you would need for your exam here. <laughs> Okay. And so, ladies and gentlemen, let's, uh, if there are other questions, let's go ahead and send those in. I'll talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, about uh, imperialism. But since there's only one question right now, and it's about the New Deal, a little bit ahead of where we are, but why not? Okay. So, what are some of the most important court cases and acts during the New Deal? Now, I'll go ahead and give you, as far as the most important court case of the New Deal, it was Schechter Poultry Corporation versus the United States. Um, and so what happened here is there was uh, the NRA, not the lot, not the interest group that exists today, but the NRA, the National Recovery Administration, uh, created by the National Recovery Act. And what it did was it authorized uh, the U.S. government to draft what they called codes of fair competition. They said that there's just way... Um, Oh, OK. That's a five person. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so uh, good. Good. All right. Good to see the five folks here. And so as far as that, as far as that goes, uh, the. The National Reco the National Recovery Administration was uh, was authorized to create codes of fair competition. Now, what happened is that federal uh, you know agents that worked for the National Recovery Administration they were going into places, including the Schechter Poultry Corporation, which by corporation it's not like a huge corporation. This was actually like a family business, a couple of Jewish kosher butchers, and the people that were coming into uh, this place they didn't understand like how. Uh, you know, kosher butchery worked, okay? Because when you think about it, when people are buying something that's kosher, it's been done a particular way, that the chicken has been slaughtered a particular way. And so this federal inspector is coming in and saying, oh, you should do it this way. You should do it this way. You're not allowed to do that. And so finally, the Schecters, uh, one day they kicked him out. They said, get out of here. And then they were put into jail and they were, you know, I think they got represented by, they may have gotten represented by 
the ACLU because um, these guys didn't have a whole lot of money to forward, you know, forward legal counsel. But what happened here is the challenge was based on the Commerce Clause. OK, the Commerce Clause of the Constitution says that the federal government has control over interstate commerce, okay, whereas the Schechter brothers, they were doing all of their business there within New York City. And so they got the chickens from New York, they sold to client, you know, customers in New York. And so the Supreme Court in Schechter uh, Poultry Corporation versus the United States, they sided against the federal government. And so as far as that goes, uh, you know, the uh, that is what leads to FDR's court packing plan, okay? So FDR decided, well, you know what? If you can't beat them, pack them, all right? So he decides that he's going to try to pack the court and creates this, you know, he, he sponsored, you know, well, advocates this legislation that would allow him to place more justices on the Supreme Court, and especially if justices hang on after a certain age, uh, that another justice could be put on there. Now, this was FDR's first legislative defeat, that even his own party wouldn't get behind this because it's something that was seen as undermining separation of powers. It's kind of like if you think about what if the Andrew Johnson impeachment would have been successful. The Andrew Johnson impeachment was obviously about politics. I mean, it was obviously political. And so as far as that is concerned, uh, this is something that uh, they are they are thinking in terms of uh, no, you can't do that. So that's those are that's something about the New Deal that gives you a court case and uh, you know goes into one of the agencies and his court packing scheme. All right, so finished with that one. Now, um, Nolan, does the AP exam ask specific question? You know, every important court case. Now, there is really only a small body of court cases that you would you know. Of course, you need to know like Marbury v. Madison, McCulloch versus Maryland. Conceivably, that could come up. Now, I would find court cases, probably the knowledge of specific court cases is probably going to be more useful to you when you are doing the short answer um, and the LEQ and the DBQ. OK, the thing is that, you know, I've got, for example, my Romulus app, which just asks straightforward trivia like, you know, questions and people are like, well, those aren't stimulus based, so those can't help me on the exam. They can help you on the exam. They help you on the 60 percent of the exam that you have to generate for yourself. That's why knowing like all of the, you know, the person that knows everything is going to do really well on that, whereas they may struggle with multiple choice, which isn't quite as well. I mean, it's, it's a little different there, but I would say that knowing specific court cases, that's going to help you more um, on your SAQ, DBQ and LEQ. All right. Um, Okay, effect. Uh, how did the Red Scare affect domestic life in American homes? Um, that is an interesting question there, Christina. That's a little, uh, deep. yeah. So, so again, oh, thank you. I'm glad the Romulus app is uh, helpful to you, Zoe. And, and again, if people understand what it is, I mean, it's like it's really more for getting you, getting that specific knowledge in your brain. And that also helps you answer the more specific knowledge you have, the better you're going to do on multiple choice. But it's about how you use that specific knowledge to connect things. So the domestic life in American homes. Now, the word you're using here is domestic. I want to make clear that uh, the first Red Scare is really about criminal aliens, okay, that a lot of people that had come over um, from, and of course, we hear some of the same rhetoric, and, uh, you know, today, now, it's certainly not like, a, you know, a sizable portion or a majority or whatever, but there certainly were people that were coming over at that time that, they were coming over because they were basically kicked out of their countries, okay, or they were running from something. And so there there were a fair amount of, uh, you know, socialists and anarchists and communists uh, coming over from, you know, Europe in this wave of new immigration um, that was coming through there. So as far as that is, uh, as far as that is concerned, uh, then, you know, we can, you know, as far as, far as that, is, that is concerned, we've got, um, you know, 
it's really only affecting a very small group of people. Like for people who are U.S. citizens, it's really not doing anything. Like the Palmer raids, for example, these were raids into the homes of um, suspected radicals who were not citizens of the United States. So as far as domestic life in American homes, um, I'm not sure that that really would have had that big of a difference there. I'm not sure where the question came from. It's a very curious question, Christine. If I had a little extra context, that would be interesting. Now, yes, the relationship with Japan. Okay, Madeline, this is a really good question. All right. So as far as the relationship with Japan and the gentleman's agreement, all right. So as far as, as far as that goes, the Chinese Exclusion Act in the 1880s, okay, that this this essentially banned Chinese immigration. Now, China was at that time, now today, China is a pretty powerful country, but China at that time was not uh, a place that was that was respected or anything, anything like that. Uh, you know, this is something that um, you know, as far as that goes, China was being imperialized by all kinds of other countries at that time. And so the United States just banned, uh, you know, banned immigration from China. Now, Japan was a little different. What we've got to remember is in the late 19th century, um, Japan became a uh, you know, became a westernized country. Like they they embraced westernization ever since Commodore Perry initiated contact in the mid 19th century that the Japanese realized that, hey, we've got to do something or else we're going to get imperialized just like these other countries. And so they they won the Russo-Japanese War. While Teddy Roosevelt was president, Japan, excuse me, Japan became the first uh, what you know, non-Western country in the modern era to defeat a Western power in a war. Now they went to Portsmouth, Maine. Uh, they went to the to Portsmouth, and Teddy Roosevelt mediated the treaty. Teddy Roosevelt won the Nobel Peace Prize for his work there. So as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, that Japan was in a situation that although they weren't Western, they were Westernizing and they gained a great deal of respect. And so what happened here now also remember Japan, very much an honor driven culture. So since Japan and the United States were on good terms, they had a gentleman's agreement that basically Japan would not let people out of the country like they would not let people board ships to the United States um, and in return the United States would not restrict Japanese immigration that the Japanese were agreeing that we are going to control we're going to control this ourselves and so we don't want the dishonor of having immigration banned from Japan so yes that's the relationship with Japan is that the United States is really treating them like an equal partner unlike China who nobody really respected at the time all right, and very, uh, very good here. Now, um, Dana, easy question for me to answer. What would you include in the DBQ about imperialism for outside evidence? Okay, Dana, same as I would for any DBQ. I would include anything that is relevant and is not mentioned in the documents, okay? You can't decide what you're going to put for outside evidence in a DBQ until you've seen the documents. And then once you've seen the documents, then you find the gap or the gaps. Usually there's going to be something that's fairly obvious, something that the average student should be able to remember that for whatever reason doesn't show up in the documents. Okay. So, so yes, as far as that goes, anything that is relevant and not in the documents. Okay. So as far as that goes, we've got uh, that. All right. I would be glad to, Madeline. Okay, so let's go ahead and explain the different imperial foreign policies of the imperial era or progressive era. Like the era, the era of U.S. imperialism overlaps with the progressive era domestically. Okay, so just like our progressive era presidents are Teddy Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, and Woodrow Wilson, our imperial presidents are also Teddy Roosevelt, William Howard Taft and uh, Woodrow Wilson, okay? So as far as that goes, um, Teddy Roosevelt from 1901 to 1909, his diplomacy was known as the big stick diplomacy. Uh, William Howard Taft, 
dollar diplomacy, and then Woodrow Wilson, moral or missionary diplomacy. Now, so as far as that, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, I don't think anybody had ever heard this proverb before he said something, but speak softly and carry a big stick, okay? This is a West African proverb, as he identified it. And this was his, the way he described his foreign policy. Now, the big stick diplomacy was, the objective here was to keep Europe out uh, of Latin America. This is the Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, okay? The Monroe Doctrine says that we don't want Europe uh, coming in and recolonizing any colonies, any former colonies that they'd lost. And so then the corollary, Roosevelt says, now there was a point where Venezuela owed some money uh, to European powers uh, for, you know, some damages during their revolution to European property. And so European powers were sending gunboats uh, to, uh, you know, to, to blockade Venezuela. And Teddy Roosevelt's like, no, 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 no. Um, we're basically like the big brother of Latin America. And if you've got an issue with Latin America, you will tell the United States and the United States will deal with this for you. OK, that we will deal with this for you. And so the other thing is to use force to defend American interest in Latin America. So the big stick was a very like rat was a very nationalist and very muscular foreign policy. Um, the Roosevelt Corollary. So basically, you know what? You've got some, some things that you need from this Latin American country. The Monroe Doctrine says that we don't want you doing this yourself. We want you doing this through us. And so as far as that goes, oh, I love, I love that. Yeah, I made this meme a little while, a little while back. Um, and so as far as that goes, remember he's, uh, it's a corollary to James Monroe's Monroe Doctrine. Okay, so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, uh, there we go. And so there is, uh, you know, Teddy Roosevelt, the receiver, dead de debt collector, debta, debta, debt co debt collector. Okay, so he's going through Latin America and basically, you know, turning it into what some people were calling a Yankee Lake. Now. His foreign policy is really in some ways like his domestic policy, okay? So the foreign policy is, um, the foreign policy is essentially, you know, remember Teddy Roosevelt had this, uh, this reputation as a trust buster, okay? Being a trust buster. And with this reputation as a trust buster, uh, Teddy Roosevelt was, you know, he wasn't going after all the trust. He was going after the bad ones. And he said the same thing here, that he's saying that, uh, you know, if a nation shows that it knows how to act with reasonable efficiency and decency in social and political matters, if it keeps order and pays its obligations, it need fear no interference from the United States. Chronic wrongdoing are an impotence which results in a general loosening of the ties of civilized society may ultimately require intervention by some civilized nation. Okay, so you see this, uh, you know, this sense of superiority, but if Latin American countries are, mind, you know, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, they don't have to worry. But if they're not doing things right, if they don't know how to act, then Teddy Roosevelt's coming in with big stick. All right. And so then, you know, just very characteristic of Teddy Roosevelt's foreign policy, the Great White Fleet, which basically from 1907 to 99, uh, Teddy Roosevelt sends these ships uh, to circumnavigate the world, uh, largely obsolete ships. But, you know, basically because we can. All right. Uh, you see that this is going through. And of course, uh, at the time, the Panama Canal was not completed. They had to go around South America, but they were able to go through the Suez Canal that the British had built in the 1860s. And so as far as that goes, the United States, the Great White Fleet, the whole purpose was so that all of these places could see this exhibition of American military power, of American naval power. Uh, no really other strategic purpose besides that. And so as far as that, the Panama Canal. And again, that's the big stick that like we asked the Colombians, like, hey, um, can we build a canal here? And the Colombians are like, nope. And so then there's a rebellion in Panama and the United States is like, you know what? We're going to recognize you as that uh, country, kind of like you think about we're doing the same thing today in Venezuela. Uh, now, I'm not a fan of that uh, 
of that socialist dictator in Venezuela. All right. But at the same time, it was interesting how the United States got involved in that real quick. OK, that this guy is uh, an adversary of the United States. As soon as someone proclaimed himself the president of Venezuela, the United States got in and backed the counter president. And we'll see how this goes. But a very similar kind of thing here that the United States then recognizes Panama. And in return, we complete the Panama Canal in 1914. And then, of course, we were also producing dreadnoughts, the USS South Carolina. They were naming them after states back then. And they name it after my home state. How about that? All right. And the Treaty of Portsmouth and that sort of thing. Now, William Howard Taft, he was known as Big Bill. And so what I remember is BBDD, Big Bill's Dollar Diplomacy. And the objective of dollar diplomacy was to protect American business interests in Latin America. And then there's the M&M &M diplomacy. All right. Woodrow Wilson's moral or missionary diplomacy. Now, I think about it. I'm not trying to flash any gang signs or anything like that. But Woodrow Wilson moral missionary. Woodrow Wilson, moral missionary. His objective here is to support democratic governments in Latin America, and the objective is also to oppose oppressive or undemocratic governments. Now, what we have to understand that there was a big difference in policy from Woodrow Wilson and Teddy Roosevelt, okay? Because when you see here that Woodrow Wilson, uh, and you can see this in the League of Nations as well, that he didn't think in terms of like, okay, what's best for the United States and what's best for projecting American power, okay? And so as far as that goes, Teddy Roosevelt's foreign policy was very muscular and nationalist, whereas Woodrow Wilson was more of an internationalist. And so that's another thing that you want to keep in mind for that. But thanks for asking the question, Madeline. All right. Um, people like the OK. So as far as that goes, Zoe, a couple things that come to mind. Now, remember, Keynesian economics uh, talks of uh, shovel ready projects. OK, shovel ready projects, which means that, you know, when people are unemployed, you create these make work projects. Now, what I'm thinking here, first of all, the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, which employed young men. And they built, uh, you know, they built they worked on national and state parks, built, uh, you know, recreation facilities, I think maybe even built some schools, but you had these young men who would live in camps and they would work. And most of the money was sent back home to their families. Okay. So that's the CCC. And then you've got the, um, the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, and the PWA, the Public Works Administration. Now, I wouldn't expect for a, an AP US history student taking a survey level course to understand what the difference between those things is. And part of that is because I, I would have to look it up to be able to know the distinction, okay? But the WPA and the PWA were very, very similar, okay? Because they were both involved in building infrastructure. Now, that's something that we'll see that President Trump last night said that he wanted to work with the Democrats uh, on an infrastructure bill. So that's actually, even though President Trump's a Republican, you know, that's very much in line with you know, FDR's New Deal. All right. So as far as that, uh, far as that goes, I'd say, yeah, the CCC, the WPA and the PWA would, uh, you know, would be, you know, at the top of the list as far as the make work projects. Now, ladies and gentlemen, remember that we are here, um, you know, all every week. OK, we're going to be here every week through the end of April with free broadcasts uh, that are at 7 p.m. And remember to go to fiveable.me for information about Fiveable Plus. Also, as uh, as we were talking about earlier, follow at Think Fiveable on Twitter and Instagram, and that's going to be your conduit to get uh, to get information. This is what the next session is going to be about, and all of that kind of stuff. Okay, so uh, as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, you want to make sure that you're following Fiveable, um, so that you have uh, access to all of these things that we're doing. And thank y'all so much for joining us. Always a pleasure to be here and uh, and helping you uh, because we're. I tell you what, I mean, it's February, so that exam is going to be in three months. So at Fiveable, we are here to help. Remember, your exam is Fiveable. It's always a pleasure.